hello. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, there might be a few more people trickling in. Maybe it'll be just a few of us in the room. That's totally fine. I've talked to smaller audiences. I'm going to have the same energy level. It's the end of the day at the first conference here at All Things Open. There's a lot of things to choose from and go to and engage with. So I appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to come and listen to us, or me, rather, up here on the stage. I'm excited to talk about today's topic, which is open sourcing all the things, which is something we're really passionate about here at All Things Open, bringing open source into every element of our lives. And today, we're going to talk about making every part of your production stack open source and why that's a good thing. But before we dive into the topic, I do just want to take a moment to introduce myself. As a listener, when I go to conferences, I like to know about the people speaking. It gives me context for what I'm about to learn. So I just want to talk about my background for just a moment. And these are my socials, by the way. You can add me on the twits and the gits, whatever works for you, and I'll retweet or like whatever you want to do. And I certainly follow back. So again, my name is Andrew. I'm a developer advocate at a company called Mattermost. Mattermost is an open source chat and collaboration platform for developers. And we actually have a booth just right outside this room. Today's talk is nothing about the company I work for, although it's really core to our mission. But if you are interested in learning more, definitely come by and talk to us during the conference. We have a really great developer demo that I put together uh, that actually walks you through making your very own monster using open source tools and nothing but a chat channel. So I'd love to show it to you all if you want to drop by our table. Now, my background is not very typical for somebody in technology. I actually have an education background. In college, I studied dead languages. I studied Latin and Greek. And I did what any Latin and Greek major would do. It makes perfect sense. I went to Japan after I graduated. And while I was in Japan, I worked with kindergartners, elementary school students, middle school kiddos, in a really rural town outside of Nagoya on the main island of Japan. And I was there for two years, working with young and special ed students, oftentimes the only foreigner they've met in their whole life. And I was responsible for teaching them how to speak English. And this was an incredible experience for me. If you can wrangle a six-year-old, you can wrangle anybody. And what I learned at this job has translated into so many new skills once I've come back to the States. So after I did this for two years, I moved back to the US. And I live in California, where I still am now. And I got a job at an education company. We were a test prep company, and we helped students get ready for the LSAT. Now, I worked there, and I worked my way up in this organization, starting just by answering phones, and then by keeping the lights on, by paying the bills, doing the insurance, taking classes on the side, because I was passionate about technology. And then, unfortunately, the pandemic happened. And for an education company, we had to rapidly transfer all of our academics into an online environment. We had to build new tools to help our students succeed. Because even though the world seemed to be on pause, their lives weren't. So we had to keep building curriculums to teach them. And it was during this process that I got really involved in open source technology. I was able to learn how to put together tools quickly and rapidly taking advantage of the things that open source enables all of us to do and create educational experiences for students that want to go to law school. And through this process, I became really passionate about open source and teaching others how to use it. I was finally really able to understand what my skills meant to me and what I wanted to do with it. So after being at that role for a few years, I had a friend who was doing DevRel. And he was telling me about the stuff he's doing. Oh, I'm making a tutorial on how to use this software. Oh, I'm going to this conference and giving this talk. And I'm having a lot of fun while doing it. And it sounded really great. So I took a career jump. I decided to start applying for developer advocate roles. And I'm very fortunate for the one I've landed at Mattermost, which 
treats me with incredible respect and gives me so many opportunities. And now I get to come to places like this and talk to y'all about technology. So this is a little bit about me, a very non-typical journey into tech. I do not have an engineering degree. I studied Latin and Greek. Really useful, I know. And I can just say that if I can translate those skills, then I know anybody can. And a really great part about this experience was learning how to work with people where English was not their first language. That's very often an experience that we have in the open source community. So learning how to communicate with empathy and with clear words and bring people together with a shared mission is something that's really important to me. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and dive in into what we're gonna talk about. This talk has three main sections about open sourcing all the things. First, we're gonna give a little bit of context and backstory. I'm gonna give a quick overview about how open source arrived at its current state. And it should help you understand how some of the technologies that we discuss are likely to mature in the future. And then after that history lesson, we're gonna analyze various technology spaces and find out how open source and proprietary technologies stack up against each other. Then we'll wrap up by sharing an extensive list of open source technologies. And this list has a lot of logos and I don't expect you to write all of it down. There's a lot of great projects on it. Many of them which are here even at this conference. But at the end of my slides, there will be a QR code that you can scan and be able to access these and go through them on your own as well. So just throwing that out there, you can definitely take pictures, really encourage it, but just know that I'll be able to give you the slides as well. So let's get started with an obvious question. Why open source? To anyone who is familiar with the concepts of open source software, which is many of us here, and those at home watching, some of these things might be obvious to you. I'm hoping there's at least a few people in this crowd, though, who are new or fresh to open source, because I really want to show you how it's taking over the world. And we're going to do that by discussing it through the lens of these six ideas. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and dive in. The first thing that comes to mind for many with open source is its security. In open source communities, Technical experts can constantly vet options available to them, and vulnerabilities are resolved in a public manner. With enough eyes on any project, all vulnerabilities are shallow. You can truly be able to work with people all across the world to find problems with code. And because it's in a shared environment, people can work together to fix those problems. With proprietary technology, however, you have to trust those security practices of the person you're buying the software from. It's oftentimes a black box, a term I'm gonna use a lot during this presentation, because you don't truly know what might go on inside, and you're kind of at the whims of what their security protocols might be. Another obvious reason why people use open source is to avoid a vendor lock-in situation. With open source, you have control over your own data, and common access protocols like, like SQL and REST are open and available to anybody. There's multiple vendors that can support and host open source platforms, but with proprietary tools, you're locked into what they want you to do and how they want you to host their services. They dictate the access to your own data and how you can migrate it. Now, with licensing, open source, this is where it gets really exciting for many people in open source, the idea of going to a GitHub project, something that does something cool or unique, going and finding the license and finding out, oh, it's a permissive license. I can fork this, flip it on its head, make it do whatever I want. And that's a really big win with open source. The permissiveness of these licenses often allows you to do whatever you want. And if you do change it, you just have to follow the rules of the license. Now, that said, not all open source projects have a very permissive license, and it's important to do your research. But Contrasted with proprietary tools, where you might have to go through a legal or a financial system to create you know, uh, approval for what you're going to do, you might need to uh, produce a lot of operational overhead in terms of the licensing to really be able to use the technology. You might have to fork over a lot of money up front 
or pay a lot of money over time just to have the privilege of using their software. And at the end of the day, they get to tell you how to use it. With data sovereignty, we're talking about the ability to store the data wherever you want with your own policies and practices. But again, with proprietary tools, you're restricted to how they tell you you can use and store your data. When it comes to producing production grade software, the widespread adoption of open source communities and numerous organizations allows tools to grow quickly, robustly, and work in a wide variety of environments. You have engineers in teams that are extremely different from each other, adapting a shared tool to work for them in multiple different settings. And the result, when this is contributed back to the project, is the project becomes more robust and able to support more unique and one-off kind of deployment instances. It becomes able to adapt to the needs of developers more easily because that's what developers need. They need things to be easier for them. With proprietary tools, however, you're subjugated to the vendor's own outages, maybe their own performance problems. Maybe they have internal structure issues or they have optimization problems. You're gonna suffer through all of that and their incentive to fix it likely is not going to be the same as yours. And if you're locked in and you have gone through these other steps that we've discussed, your ability to resolve that for yourself can get more and more limited. Now with extensibility, this is the part where open source sings. People are most excited about extensibility in open source, and oftentimes when people talk about their favorite project, they mention, oh, and you can make it do anything you want. You can add whatever you want to it. It's open source. You can extend it to your heart's content. The ability to view and modify code and make it infinitely extensible makes it easy to customize and it makes it more robust. But again, with proprietary tools, you're forced to rely on vendor-managed APIs and customizations, and those customizations, at the end of the day, might be designed to entrap you, to keep you there, to keep you paying for the license, to keep you paying for the privilege of them giving you their code. And at the end of the day, that code may not be robust enough for the things you need it to do. So now that we've gone through those six big reasons why people use open source and why open source is often better when it stacks up against proprietary tech, let's look at examples of how this has played out in the real world. That way you don't have to just take my word for it. For example, in 2011, Mark Andresen coined the term, software is eating the world. I love this term. Software is eating the world. It tells the story of how software has become the most disruptive force in industries across the world. And all of these industries shift rapidly to favor companies that embrace open source tools and software faster than their competitors. For example, Amazon, for better or for worse, was able to create a more robust online marketplace and wipe out entire generations of stores all across the world that would provide services and products to people in their town. Amazon was able to do that faster and better because they were able to build technology to help them. With Netflix, and this is a familiar story, if any of you still have your Blockbuster card, they wiped out an entire generation of brick and mortar video rental stores. You used to be able to go to a store, well, be able's a one term for it, you used to have to go to a store and you know, use your card, your membership, maybe check out a movie you wanna watch for a week. That was the norm. And then you know, there were things like Redbox. You could go outside of a, like a Walmart or something and get a DVD directly from a, mach like a vending machine and that was pretty innovative. But at the end of the day, Netflix was able to wipe all of this out. And now, streaming is king. And streaming can only be king because of technology. Walmart used industry-leading logistics to get their products across the US with freighters at a cheaper and faster way than their competitors. And similar to Amazon, 
they were able to spread across the entire country at a much more affordable scale. Kodak basically disappeared. Kodak, a long-standing film company that was responsible for, frankly, archiving most of the world's experiences up until very recently, and it was wiped out by technology. Digital cameras, being able to go to a store and print things out, put your photos in the cloud, share them with your friends. Why even print them? You can just post them on social media. That's all because of technology. So all of these industries have shifted rapidly during our lives. We've all seen it happen, and that's all because of technology. Now, in 2011, Mark Andreessen said that software is eating the world. And in 2013, Michael Scott said open source is eating software. Open source technology are increasingly viewed as the best option for software features for speed and security. And in the time since that was said, in 2013, there's nothing that's eating open source. Open source is the big fish in the pond. And you can see this in plain sight. There are a growing list of open source companies valued at more than a billion dollars. You know, several of these companies are here. GitLab and Elastic and Red Hat, which is, you know, their headquarters is just right across the street. We're very familiar with them. These are companies that are huge and they're open source. There's explosive foundation growth from organizations that recognize that open source software is the future. They invest money into open source projects, technologies, and companies that build those technologies to create this robust open source network of tools that we now use on most of our back end. And they invest in this because it makes sense, because they get returns, because open source delivers for them. Now going into some concrete examples, this section is called All Roads Lead to Bell because we're gonna talk about how technology often started in an environment, specifically in this case, Bell Laboratories, and, and it was closed, it was expensive, and a lot of times the only institutions that would have access to it were military or very high-end universities that were doing research, and those technologies were not accessible. They started at inaccessible, and then they morphed over time. So for example, the story of Linux with its global operating system dominance. Now this is a pretty obvious story for many. In the late 1960s, Bell Labs, they created Unix. Now that was something that ran on their own expensive proprietary hardware and it created serious headwinds for developer adoption. It was not something that most people had access to. But in the 1980s, New, which is you know with a G, the silent G, G and U, they attempted to usurp the dominix, the domination of Unix. They were going to revolutionize the access to this kind of technology, but they struggled on one part. The kernel, the part that communicated from the actual software that would sit above it to the hardware below. And that was until a hobbyist project in 1991 by someone named Linus. And Linus gave his name to Linux. And Linux has taken over the world. Linux was a personal project created by Linus because he was frustrated with the access to computers and technology and he saw an opportunity. An opportunity to make technology more widespread and adaptive. So when he created it as a pet project, it experienced rapid growth and expansion and in 1994, version one was released, and the rest is history. Now, machines that use Linux-based operating systems run on virtually every machine in the world. They power a lot of the things that we take for granted, and a lot of the tools that allow the world to work like it does today. Now, Git is also another story that starts at Bell Labs. In 1972, Bell Labs released source code control system, which is a name you give a product when 
There's literally no other way to call it. This is a brand new idea. The idea of taking software worked on by other developers, taking their code, putting it in one spot, and allowing them to all work in a collaborative way. This is key if you want to have more than one person working on a project. Everybody who works in software is familiar with source control, and most of us use Git, but Git is not something that's always been around. It started with technology from the Bell Labs, and then in the 1980s through the early 2000s, you start seeing other alternatives like CVS, SVN, BitKeeper, and Subversion, like I said. And the, these open source tools, they achieved broad adoption, but not universal. People were still conflicted about how they should make their code and share it and collaborate on it with others. And until this problem could get solved, we couldn't innovate fast enough. Source code was meant to be shared, and we needed an environment to do it. So in 2005, Git was built and adopted by the Linux community in response to controversies within BitKeeper. And it ultimately took off. In 2008, GitHub was launched and became basically ubiquitously a social media network for developers. Most people have a GitHub account. Most people are used to using GitHub. And GitHub obviously is built on Git. In 2014, GitLab was launched, and that's an open source competitor. And one of those logos we saw just a moment ago. And the last 10 years has seen an incredible proliferation of infrastructure as source code, source code solutions allow people to rapidly innovate. And that's all because it's open source. The foundational parts of what we take for granted in the software world are ultimately open source. Git itself is a center point for most things in the technology space. Now, another example is Kubernetes. Kubernetes doesn't have a timeline, really, because Kubernetes is happening in real time in front of us right now. While we're in this room, people are innovating on, on Kubernetes in a way that maybe will be different tomorrow. It's hard to really capture how quick things are exploding in this space. Now, containerization, again, is nothing new. This is an idea that started as old as computers and operating systems and certainly has history, again, back in Bell Labs. But now, suddenly, we have a massive ecosystem of open source and proprietary solutions around tools like Kubernetes. So from walking through those few steps, there are some takeaways based upon what we've learned with that history. One, viral open source technology can commoditize portions of software markets virtually overnight. Again, that's key, the virality of it. Popular open source projects allow people to innovate faster, and the faster other people can innovate, the faster people downstream can build on top of them. Number two, industries tend to center around a small number of key open source to projects. Again, these are things like Linux, Git, even Docker, and Kubernetes. And three, the most successful open source technologies build a broad proliferation of niche customizations, configurations, and supporting technologies that orbit around them. They create an ecosystem, a healthy ecosystem. Maybe this tool does this and not much else, and this tool does this and nothing else, and together they solve a wider problem within a sphere. It's just like what we see in nature, when software forms natural ecosystems around accessible open source tools, everything in that ecosystem can thrive because they can see each other and adapt to each other. Otherwise, everything is behind closed doors. So now that we've talked about relevant history, let's talk about what open source looks like now today. Now we're gonna do that in the lens of three different types of categories. One of them is where open source is dominant, where it's already winning. And another one is emerging open source fields, places where open source is starting to creep into the corners and really revolutionize and flip the table. And last, we're going to look at laggards, parts of technology that maybe they have some open source solutions, but they're not quite there yet. And it's healthy and good to find them and label them, 
figure out maybe what they're struggling with. Is there an opportunity for an open source project to innovate on things that are laggards? In most cases, yes. So starting with the complete open source domination, let's talk about infrastructure. At this point, your operating system, your web server, and most of your security technology should probably all be open source. Most of your technology stacks are open source. Most developmental languages are open source. And the languages that become open source always achieve a higher level of adoption once they choose to do so. For example, recently, Microsoft made .NET open source before it was not. And since they've made it open source, it's achieved a wider adoption among developers because they want to use open source languages. Another one is you know, app deployment and scaling. These are things like containerization, orchestration, automation. These tools are overwhelmingly open source because they sit on top of the same core projects that open source is also a part of. And together, they've all spawned, again, a really large ecosystem of options. Within each of these, there's a lot of tools you can choose from. And everybody is going to probably choose a different thing that they're comfortable with. And at the end of the day, all of those tools are probably going to be able to achieve the same thing. Because there have been other people who have walked that road and have said, oh, I need this to do that. But I don't want to change everything I've done. Why don't I go to the project, see if there's other like-minded people. And why don't we work together to make this tool do what we need it to do? In emerging open source spaces, you have things like CICD. You know, a lot of the core functionality for CICD is multiple competing open source projects, but there are still many proprietary services that exist and thrive around performance, scalability, data compliance, and premium services. Proprietary tools can live alongside open source if they offer something that open source can't, but Open source technology can often catch up to them. And when they're equal, maybe open source can offer more than proprietary tools. Within you know, IDEs, code editors, you know, most of the popular code editors people use these days, especially brand new devs, they're open source. A lot of people use things like VS Code and things that they can access in their browser. You know, that's probably widely available. But there are still several holdouts. And, some languages that have very robust proprietary IDEs, and people stick to them because they stick to what they know, and why change it if it's not broken? And at the end of the day, it's the tool they use to write the code, but it's not the code itself. And so this being proprietary in some ways makes sense. Another realm is with service monitoring and with metrics. There are quite a few entrenched service offerings out there from companies around service monitoring that are, you know, they're proprietary, they're not open source. And a lot of this is because, you know, they've tried to solve every problem that might come up with service monitoring. But where open source is emerging is providing more tailored, specific solutions to problems. Maybe you don't need this monolithic service monitoring tool that looks at everything and reports it a thousand different ways. Maybe you just need a simple tool that tells you when something's unhealthy through code. And all you need to be able to do is explain to it what it needs to look for. Those one-off kind of open source solutions grow in an ecosystem. They combine to create larger tools. And over time, they will scale up. And they will become more robust than proprietary offerings. Another thing that's emerging is the Internet of Things. There's a lot of software that goes on to machines and technology these days, actual devices that we order off of websites. And you know we use them in our homes. They live alongside us. And many people have their own doubts, suspicions, fears, dislikes of them. But at the end of the day, they make life convenient and more accessible for people across the world. And these technologies, these industrial things, are things that often have to be produced, right? The Internet of Things is things like your fridge is on your Wi-Fi. Someone has to make the fridge, so it makes sense that there's proprietary companies behind these kind of offerings. They have the overhead, the resources, and the scalability to produce things that have a physicality to them. So that makes sense. But a growing amount of IoT software 
is open source. And with accessibility of creating your own IoT technology in the future, this could rapidly change too. Another thing that's been emerging is cross-platform apps and, a, and you know, changing your apps to work on different types of devices. Now, with iOS and Android, open source adoption is kind of limited to them at the moment, but they are widely adopted within those spaces. And the last one here is machine learning. Most libraries and tools around machine learning, or at least a lot of the big ones that we know about because they're open, you know, they're open source, you can use them, change them, fork them, spin them on their head, but at the end of the day, the computer is only as good as the data you feed it. And the data has to be good. It has to learn from data that makes sense. And you're not just going to find that out in the wild. You're not naturally going to find a beautiful list, a huge Excel document that's going to make your machine learning understand everything it needs to know about a problem. You yourself may not even be able to construct it based upon the complex problem you're trying to solve. Or the solutions for what you're trying to feed into your machine might be locked away behind a gate somewhere. This is where data brokers come in. People who control the data, who curate it, and monitor it over time, create these well-maintained and robust libraries of data for machine learning software to learn from. And a lot of times, that's locked away behind a vendor. You have to pay somebody for that. And that makes sense, because they have to put in the work to collect it. And looking at some laggards here, when I say laggards, for those maybe not familiar with this word, I mean people that are falling behind. They're not maybe quite at the same level, these other tools, these platforms that we're talking about. One of them is with user-facing apps. Most of the apps you put on your phone or that you download onto your computer overwhelmingly are not open source. Things that face consumers who never need to touch code, never want to touch code, those are given to them in a non-open source way. Maybe they can use a tool on their phone, but then they can't go change it. That code belongs to somebody else because ultimately it's just something that's user facing. Now, there are obviously exceptions, like the own, my own company I work for. We're a chat company, and we're open source. But those exceptions can be limited, depending on the space. Another one is with user data and the capture of it. This isn't really exactly software, but it's things like geolocation, product usage, third-party APIs, and tracking. They provide critical functionality that today's users expect in order for things to work for them in the way that other things work too. But overwhelmingly, these types of libraries and tools are proprietary. They're locked away behind services you have to pay for. And the last one is desktop environments. Despite the emergence of things like Linux, Windows and Apple are still massively, overwhelmingly popular. And the default computer that most people, when they go to the store to get, they purchase. Now, despite this, obviously Linux is growing, but the opportunities for Linux to overtake Windows and Apple are limited because at the end of the day, we live in a digital world where most people have to be digital citizens, whether they want to or not. And they're going to choose the easiest option. And oftentimes, the easiest option is what was built and marketed for them specifically. Open source technologies tend to revolve more around developer use cases, but a desktop environment is something that most people need in order to survive and thrive in today's world. So now that we have an understanding of where open source is strong, let's focus on four major use cases that are really ripe for open source adoption within your tech stack. We're going to look at them as infrastructure, application deployment and scaling, code management and collaboration, and service monitoring and alerting. It's great because that's more than four, but we're going to be able to go through all of them anyways. So the most convincing example that we've already talked about is infrastructure. You know, I've already shared the story of Linux and how it's dominated the space. Databases are similarly dominated by open source due to things like SQL. In the web server space, you have things like Apache. It's been around for more than two decades. They were one of the foundations even that we saw earlier because they understand the importance of emerging open source tech. And there's a handful of other open source projects that dominate this space. And again, these are the slides I was talking about at the beginning that have logos on them. I'm not going to be able to name everything that's up here. It's just a smattering of some examples within categories. But at the end of this list, there will be a QR code 
So if you want to grab this presentation and check some of these out later, please be my guest. And the last one here on the side, security. You know, that's long been dominated by open source. Security is, is heart to open source. But there's a new generation of tools like Let's Encrypt that bring higher order functions to security and make it more accessible for others. And now, looking at application deployment and scaling, you have things like Kubernetes, which is kind of the star child right now. We talked about how that timeline is in such flux, you can't really pin it. There's so many things changing within that space. But it's one of the largest open source communities. And most services you find will center around or offer things related to the space. There's multiple waves of open source deployment and automation software available, and they've matured over the last decade. These are tools that haven't just popped up overnight. These are solutions that have worked for others over time and have grown through their open source communities, through engineers and large companies across the world who've needed their software to work for them in their unique instances. We're able to take these tools, make them work, and then contribute back to a project so others can succeed. Because they understand that within their ecosystem, the stronger and more robust everybody is, the better they will be too. And another one is things like message streams and cross-platform integrations. These are, again, opportunities for you to look at tools that perform these services that are open source. Looking at things like code management and collaboration, this is a really great space where open source tools are rich and they're well supported. They have many features that can offer you the support that you need. And a lot of people here are already familiar with things like GitLab, and that's an open source alternative to GitHub. But there's also other open source alternatives too. And within CI CD, you have the same story. And again, in testing and in the collaboration space, you have open source tools that allow you to work on Word documents, make presentations, or chat with your coworkers. In the documentation space, Open source is overwhelmingly the number one choice. Documentation is often approached in the same manner by organizations across the world. And it's incentivized for them to use similar tools to each other so that they can have understandable documentation that others are familiar with, that they can structure and generate their code documentation based upon what people already expect. There's a huge advantage to using open source to achieve this. Within service monitoring and alerting, the last decade has been explosive within the open source space. It's disrupted a market that was primarily dominated by proprietary offerings that tried to solve every problem at once. And the ones that are emerging, they maybe solve one or two or a handful of problems really well. But if you just have one or two problems you're trying to solve, that's way better use of your time. You can double down on a tool that's going to do exactly what you need it to, and in the future, if your needs grow beyond what it offers, it's not the end of the road, it's just a fork in the road. Do you take the project and do you spin it off on your own, make it do what you need to do? Do you contribute back to the open source community, make that core tool more robust for others? You can do either of those things. You're not just hitting a dead end. You don't have to beg a vendor to make their tool do what you need it to do. And their incentives may not line up with yours. So leading yourself with the most leash to be able to do what you need to do in the future is important as an engineer. When we write code, we write code for now, but we write code for five years in the future and 10 years in the future. Will I, in a week from now, be able to look at this and know what it did? These are the same ideas that people think of when they approach open source tools. So now that we've covered those different categories, we're going to just summarize what we've gone over, looking at a few key kind of takeaways. One of them is, despite me up here, you know, evangelizing, obviously, about open source because, you know, one, that's my job, but two, I'm passionate about it. You don't always have to choose open source. Don't feel obligated. Be strategic about where and how you adopt your tools. Don't just use the tool because everybody else does, but the same day, stick with proprietary solutions if they make sense for you. Despite what I just said a moment ago, you should try to look to leaders, maybe see where they're going, 
And if they're going the same way as you, or if you want to be the same as them, maybe you should follow their lead. In most cases, if a huge organization managing a large projects and huge amounts of capital, responsible for doing huge tasks in the world we live in today, if they can trust open source, if they can make open source work for them, if at the end of the day, that's where they put their money, then you probably could too. There's a lesson to be learned by their research. They're gonna be careful. They wanna be around in five years, 10 years, 50 years. Every company wants the plan to be there forever. So when they choose to use a technology, it's not a light decision. So look at the technologies that large companies use and emulate their choices when it makes sense for you. Don't blindly follow the leader, but certainly look to them. And another option, of course, is giving back. Despite the picture, this does not have to be financial. That's the best part about open source. You can contribute to open source in so many ways. You don't even have to write code. You could provide community support, accessibility support. You can test things. You can write documentation. You can mediate within a community, grow that community. You can help them make decisions about where the project should go. You can get invested. And that is what is important about giving back. If you use tools to succeed, and you succeed because of those tools, it makes sense that you should go back to those tools and help them succeed too. Because in the future, when you gotta take that next big step, you want the tool to be able to come with you. And it's important to give back your time and your energy and your respect to projects that allow you to be quick and aggressively expand. So now we've reached the end of my talk and there's a little bit of time for questions. But again, here's the QR code. Please feel free to scan it. If you manage to not grab it, that's totally fine. I'll be here after. More than happy to provide it. And for anybody at home as well, and here in the room, if you want to reach out to me, ask any questions about what I've talked about, I'd love to connect with anybody and everybody and hear what you thought about the presentation. And for those here using the app as well, there's an opportunity to provide feedback. I would love to hear from anybody who has something to provide about what they heard today. I'd love to get your opinion, learn about what's important to you, and how I can make this talk better for others in the future. So with that, thank you. All right, so does anybody have any questions? No one has any questions? You guys are ready to head out? It's almost five o'clock. So I'll start with one. Andrew, did you know that Adam and Eve actually had the first computer? Is this an Apple joke? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was an Apple, it only had one bite, and then everything crashed. That's a good one. All right, so anybody have any questions about everything he just went over? It is the end of the day. I know that people are kind of running out of energy. Me too, despite my ability to project, despite all odds, but you know, I'm gonna be here for a few minutes after. I'll be here tomorrow. And again, we have the table right outside. I'd love to hear from anybody and everybody. Yeah, go ahead. You know, it, as adoption of an open source library grows, it becomes more time consuming, more expensive to maintain for the author. What are some good ways that you've seen authors monetize uh, the work and effort that goes into creating an open source library? And that's a, that's a great question. So uh, first I wanna start by just saying that as something grows really quickly, especially with an open source, the first key thing you should put in place is a community a community of people who are invested in the same tools that you are. If you're a project leader for an open source tool, leveraging the people who are involved with your technology is key to being able to adapt in the future. And then when it comes to where, oh, we need this money for our hosting to provide these tools in the future, to train people how to use it, this is where you get foundational support that believes in your mission. You get them to invest in what you're building because they can see it right in front of them. It's open source. And so the key thing in the very, very beginning is to seek out help 
from larger entities. If you know there's a big project or a big organization using your tool and they're thriving because of it, you don't have to feel like you're going to them and begging. They're succeeding because of the robustness you're providing. And it's their incentive to help you succeed too. And so go to them, provide the solutions, the, the ideas, the, the problems you're facing, and start a conversation. That's often the best time and the best way to solve that problem. Thank you.